Hello and welcome to the AI for Global Good session. I am Londres Signier, Senior Fellow at the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution, and I'm fortunate to be your moderator for today. As you know, the World Economic Forum has always been committed to improve the state of the world. New technology emerge, such as generative AI, and they have the potential to tremendously transform economies, societies, and industries. However, the benefits are not shared equally around the world. The Forum's AI Governance Alliance, through its global member base, has initiated for over a year the development of the global roadmap to enhance equitable and global access to AI technologies. The Inclusive AI Growth and Development Initiative aims to support policymakers, industry leaders, and other stakeholders. As part of the work and what uh, we are to discuss today with our esteemed speakers are ways for all the all stakeholders to collectively engage and help leveraging the benefit uh, of AI while mitigating its risk. In order to engage and, uh, and receive wisdoms, we are joined today by an incredible group of distinguished panelists, including Omar Sultan Al Olama, Minister for, uh, uh, of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy, and Remote Work Applications for the United Arab Emirates. We also have Prof. Jan Lequin, Vice President and Chief Artificial Intelligence uh, for Meta. We have also Sebastian Niles, who is President and Chief Legal Officer of Salesforce, and Crystal Rijeje, who is Managing Director for the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So let me start with you. Uh, Minister, what practical initiative has the UAE taken to promote global accessibility to AI? And also, uh, what are the learning that you think can be exported uh, in other regions of the world? Thank you very much for having me, and it's an absolute pleasure being here and contributing to the session. The UAE has been on a journey for the last seven years to be a practical custodian of AI and to do it in a way that can be replicated, can be scaled, and can be emulated in other countries. Now, there are many different efforts that the UAE has um, gone through when it comes to artificial intelligence locally and internationally. On the international front, probably the most recent uh, announcement was the large language model that the UAE produced and exported that um, uh, focuses on the Hindi language, um, uh, it's called uh, Nanda. And we also worked on a lot of initiatives on creating large language models focused on climate, large language models focused on the Arabic language, really finding what are the gaps that exist uh, today that can be uh, you know, bridged by the UAE's efforts. Internally, we've seen a lot of practical use cases when it comes to artificial intelligence because our focus is to deploy AI not just for productivity gains, but for quality of life improvements. So if you look at, for example, alleviating traffic in cities that have incredible uh, pull and, and attraction uh, capabilities to bring global talent uh, to them, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, we do have a challenge that the infrastructure might not be able to be built as fast as the inflow of people that's coming in uh, is. And in that circumstance, maybe the only solution is leveraging AI to get people from one point to the other in the most uh, efficient way possible through optimizing traffic lights through optimizing public transportation 
and to, through also making smart investments to alleviate bottlenecks that exist across uh, these cities. Um, what we're seeing is that the promise of AI is actually endless. You can deploy it in many different fields and you can actually see results. The only challenge is, does it make economic sense? So I was talking to Jan uh, you know, before the session started, and what we were discussing is, is every single application that is being presented economically feasible? This is what governments need to do. They need to understand where it's worth investing, deploying, and putting in the effort, and where today the technology is not ready to take over. So these are just a few examples. I love the point you are making, you are making uh, ministers. Would you mind elaborating on how you have successfully exported uh, some of those uh, technologies, uh, our capability for adoption in other regions of the world? So it depends if we're talking about specifically large language models or we're talking about AI infrastructure. So, you know, maybe some of the investments that um, you might have seen the UAE has made, we've uh, built a world-class um, uh, data center in Kenya, for example, focused on renewable energy. Uh, our focus there is to make sure that the African continent is able to build uh, infrastructure that will allow them to be part of the uh, new revolution when we talk about artificial intelligence. So they have data centers, they have the talent and the capabilities there. We've worked on many different programs working on upstream and downstream when it comes to uh, the, the technological requirement to work on AI. Well, whether it's something as basic as teaching people how to code. So we have a program in Ethiopia to teach 10 million people how to code. Uh, we believe algorithmic thinking is necessary to get the youth to understand what technology can do for them and what it will not be able to do for them, to understand how to deploy and leverage this technology uh, effectively, for example. Uh, and then you know we have projects, as I, like I mentioned, in Kenya focused on data centers. On the large language model side, so the UAE has um, worked on a open source large language model called Falcon. One thing that we are doing as well is working across different geographies, trying to see how we can customize Falcon to cater to the needs of uh, these governments that uh, today do not have the ability to build their own large language model, deploy their own uh, AI tools, and do it effectively and also be able to iterate continuously on them. Fabulous. Professor Lecun, so how do the leading gen AI developers such as Meta approach the issue of global AI inclusivity? So Meta is a little bit unique in the AI industry in that it makes all of its uh, foundational AI infrastructure open source and free, free to use. And what we've seen is that a lot of uh, countries, uh, particularly in the global south, have adopted those platforms for all kinds of applications because it enables uh, communities, whatever they are, whether they are uh, you know, private industry, uh, NGOs, governments, or just uh, cultural groups, to fine tune those systems for their language, their culture, their value system, their centers of interest. And I, I think it's the only way to go, really. I, I, I don't see how in the future when AI will constitute the repository of all human knowledge, how a single entity, particularly on the West Coast of the US, can you know, train those systems so that they cater to the entire world population. It has to be put in the hands of people so that they can fine tune them, train them with their cultural uh, material and everything. Uh, so so that, that's the vision for the future that we, we envision. Um, and for, for that, it's a, it's a model that is not completely new. Um, the entire software infrastructure of the internet or the mobile communication network is all open source. Uh, and the reason it's open source is because people want it to be open source because you know, it's easier to uh, customize, to disseminate, to port to new platform, et cetera. So I think... Uh, uh, open source AI is really the, the, main, the main driver for that. Thank you, I like the point. And how do you operationalize uh, the, that dimension, especially in the least developed countries around the world? So in, in, in various, various different ways. So the first one is you just make the models, the basic models available, right? They've been trained to 
uh, do basic things on all the publicly available uh, data on the internet, all the ones that is, uh, can be used. Uh, the problem with this is that the linguistic diversity, for example, is not that great. Uh, you know, a lot of content is in English, and uh, there is very little content in, certainly in regional languages or in dialects that are not written, particularly, uh, which I think is very important to, to preserve. Um, so, so just just making the, the models available for people to fine tune uh, with with their material, cultural material, linguistic material, etc., um, is the first thing. The second thing is directly partnering with organizations that can actually uh, drive this. Um, whether they are governments, for example, so there is partnership between Meta and the government of India, so that future versions of the open source um, uh, LLM from Meta called Lama. Uh, can speak at least all 22 official languages of India and perhaps you know all the hundreds of local languages and dialects. Uh, there's a similar issue in, in Africa, obviously, where linguistic diversity is, is enormous. Um, so uh, there also there are sort of various uh, partnerships where you know Meta essentially helps uh, people. But ultimately, I think what we need is a very simple open infrastructure. Think of it as Wikipedia for AI systems, right? So. Wikipedia is open to the entire world. Anybody can contribute. Um, how about having a similar infrastructure for training AI systems or fine tuning them so that basically anyone can contribute to educating those AI systems uh, you know, for you know, local languages and cultures and et cetera? And Professor Lequin, how do we ensure that those uh, applications are adapted to the needs of the people around the world in addition of being open? So you give them the ability to do that, to, to build a, the, the systems that are useful for local population. I'm just going to give you a single example because it's done by a former colleague and friend, Mustafa Sisse in Senegal. He, he's built an application uh, based on open source uh, LLMs. Uh, to give access to medical information to people is very difficult to get an appointment with a doctor in Senegal, particularly if you are in rural areas. Um, so you can you can talk to an AI, an AI assistant for this, but it has to speak Wolof in addition to French and, and three other official languages of Senegal. So um, so again, that's only enabled by uh, open source tools. Um, and then you know there is you know helping so making making it easy for 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 people to to do this on their own. Fantastic. And now turning to Sebastian Niles, Salesforce uh, recently launched its sustainable AI policy principles. Could you tell us more about uh, them and how these principles or other uh, could be used uh, to promote equitable access? Uh, to AI. Yeah, sure. No, happy, happy to do so. I think you know, stepping back for a moment though, when we think of the sustainability, the stewardship, right, element of whether it's generative AI, whether it's sort of how we were leading in predictive AI, and now moving forward with agentic AI, these concepts of sustainability, of equality, of trust, right, of customer stakeholder success, of innovation, really do we feel have to be at the core. So whether it's when it comes to you know the sustainability principles for AI, for how are we measuring and managing and ensuring all providers right, of, of AI systems are disclosing their environmental impact, or how are we ensuring that AI is being leveraged for environmental stewardship or you know, planetary stu stewardship or other sets of items is, is very important. Um, you know, we have a Salesforce accelerator, our AI for impact uh, you know, set of programs, or whether it's working through our Salesforce Ventures arm or Uplink or other initiatives to make sure that initiatives and startups and businesses really of all sizes that are focused on whether it's climate, whether it's on nature positive, set of solutions or other parts of broader uh, sort of set of impact are being you know, funded and encouraged. Um, I might also step back though for a moment and think about sort of philosophy, philosophically sort of at Salesforce, the way we approach um, not just you know, agentic AI, but sort of more broadly, the role of business is really threefold. First, that the purpose of business ought to be to solve problems. Solve the problems of people, solve the problems of planet, and solve the problems of other businesses. You know, two is that business truly can be the greatest platform 
for innovation, for transformation, but most importantly for positive change. And just three, those values, you know, that I mentioned, as, as we kind of drive forward, and you know, uh, the other panelists here sort of mentioned this, um, as we think of how do we create an ecosystem of trust, an ecosystem of sustainability, an ecosystem of innovation, an ecosystem, right, of equality, you know, an ecosystem of this customer stakeholder success, we must make these technologies uh, empowering. See, we must make them easy. We must democratize access to the technology. You know, just this past week, uh, we were in um, you know San Francisco. You know, for our uh, Dreamforce and Agent Force uh, sort of launches and, and conferences. I highlight that only because we had tens of uh, th uh, thousands of people just sitting together with us, and we said, "Let's sit with you. Let's build your first agent." Actually, let's together, and some people said, oh, well, I understand it, I'm not that interested. No, 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 I mean, these are you know, senior level administrators, right, you have heads of, uh, you know, sort of companies, you have people sort of are trailblazers, but sort of sitting with them and getting into the system on the Salesforce platform, you know, there's, and let's build the actual workable agentic AI, the agents that can drive, right, the business outcomes, the environmental, the social outcomes, and just the way in which you see people's eyes light up, like of all ages, okay, including, you know, folks like, who've been doing this for, for many decades, but to actually put your hands in the soil, right? To your point and others is this is how we democratize access to the technology, make it very inclusive and ensure that the, the potential is available not just to a few, right, uh, but to all and is fundamentally empowering. So I really like uh, the dimension of access that you are highlighting, but we also know that uh, between access uh, usage uh, and productive uh, usage of those technology, the, we have variations around the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, how do you engage to ensure that uh, the uh, corporations, but also the people who have access, will also be using those technologies productively uh, to be contributors of the society for economic prosperity. Uh, look, I think you've raised such a, a fundamental point. Uh, it really is about having healthy ecosystems around all these different sets of dimensions, right? Being very inclusive also that you have all the whole range of communities being part of the product feedback, the product development, and really kind of crowdsourcing in different ways. What are the most transformative use cases, right, that are practical, that are feasible, but also unlocking, you know, the right sets of, you know, creativity. What we're also seeing is that this is a very unique moment, you know, sure, around AI, agentic AI, whatnot, but it's also a leadership moment. And so how do you balance innovation with robust self-governance, right, with common sense regulation, with inclusivity that actually delivers, right, at scale and, you know, and with the right momentum? So I think you have to really kind of look very broadly across all communities, you know, across all industries, and really say, let's all work together in new ways to drive, uh, you know, the opportunity forward. So I, I like this point and connected to it, we, we know that the digital divide has been yes. monumental and uh, many scholars and experts are highlighting the fact that the AI divide is even wider than the digital uh, divide. So are you optimistic of, of your ability to contribute, to bridge, uh, or the ability of various industries and multi multiple stakeholders to bridge the AI divide more than what was done uh, for the digital divide. <laughs> uh, I am optimistic if we can all achieve collectively to do several things. One, as we connect the unconnected, mm -hmm. we also then take the next step to say once folks are connected, right, what are the next set of steps, right? So not only have access to the tools and the technology, but how are the, you know, as how is everyone deploying them, using them, right? Helping to build the next great organizations, industries, you know, out of the future. You know, I think too, back to this concept of empowerment, you know, back to the element of how do we bring forth, you know, really the best, you know, of all sort of different you know, sort of set of communities to be deploying the technologies in a way that uplift communities, uplift families, right? Kind of grapple with sort of these other, you know, sort of issues. And I think three, when you look at whether it's the potential of, of AI and whether it's in healthcare, or it's another set of practical sort of business sets of areas, um, the issue of shortfalls and gaps, 
right, around, we have critical areas, and I think, you know, the World um, Health Organization, I think this is 10 million, uh, you know, shortfall of healthcare workers, right? You can, each, each area, we have sort of incredible shortfall. Well, how do we use agentic AI systems to actually fill those types of labor gaps and those types of shortfalls? And this, I think, is going to be one of the key ways in which we're able to achieve, whether it's the sustainable, sustainable development goals, whether it's other sets of priorities, but the only way we're gonna operate and achieve and uh, bridge so many gaps in many ways, we have to do so in trust, we have to do so at scale, right? And we also just have to do so collectively and together. Thank you so much. Uh, and let me turn now uh, to Crystal. So what are some initiatives that uh, Rwanda has adopted uh, to accelerate uh, the, uh, dis the broader dissemination of AI and technology, the adoption in the broader society. Thank you, Landry. Uh, happy to be here with all of you. Um, so when I, I reflect on you know, this question of what are some of the key initiatives, it's really been, I think, more so a deliberate strategy that the government has taken that's been put in place um, for several decades now. So I look back to uh, the year 2000. Um, and this is really just coming out of, you know, kind of the darkest time in the country, the 1994 genocide, and, you know, really strategic decisions that had to be made in how to rebuild the country. And not just, you know, re uh, reconstruct the country that was, you know, completely destroyed, but really being able to think forward to say, we're not just responding to the challenges in this moment, but where do we want to be, you know, 20 years from now, you know, 50 years from now. And so the Vision 2020, um, you know, strategy that was put in place into 2000 was to build a knowledge-based economy. And so when I reflect on this moment that we're in now in 2024 and the, the kind of investments and decisions that were made um, over 20 years ago, it's really what has prepared us to um, kind of be able to fully at least start to harness some of the benefits, um, you know, in this, this moment where AI is really coming of age, you know, so starting with investments, you talked about um, uh, the need for connectivity, uh, you know, there were really deliberate investments in being able to connect, you know, the entire population. Now we have 97% of the population that's connected to broadband. Um, the other, you know, the other, you know, important element is the people. You must invest in the people if you're going to have a knowledge-based economy. And so not just just having the basic levels of digital literacy, but meaningful uh, digital literacy. So being able to access services, e-government services, um, or you know any kind of digital services that are really adding value to their lives, uh, making their lives more convenient, um, you know, improving their lives and, and livelihoods. But at the other end of the spectrum, um, not just you know talking about uh, you know digital literacy, but really being able to invest in the future technology leaders, the future you know technology innovators. One example I can point to uh, was the government inviting uh, Carnegie Mellon University to set up an Africa campus um, in Kigali. And as, as you know, many of you know, you know Carnegie Mellon is, an, is a pioneer you know, in the field of artificial intelligence. So being able to have the presence of a world-class institution like that, offering master's degrees, not just to Rwandans, but you know, to a Pan-African um, kind of pool of, of talent um, you know, in, in the field of artificial intelligence and, and many other, you mentioned Mustafa Sisse also, you know, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, you know, these are really intentional steps to build um, uh, not just the digital talent, you know, stack, but really that top tier of talent that will help us to transition not just from being consumers of, of, uh, of the technology or AI, but really be being able to take part in developing solutions that are, you know, contextually relevant um, because they're, they're the most familiar, you know, with, with both the challenges and the opportunities that are there. And I would say lastly, really, um, you know, also making sure that, you know, to tie it all together, that it has to be, uh, you know, the foundational enabling environment, you know, for innovation. And that starts with policy and, 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 and legislation in, in some cases. And so one of the things that we worked on as a center supporting the Ministry of ICT is uh, the, the, the law on the protection of personal data and privacy that was put in place in 2021. You know, we know that data is oxygen of, of AI and, and these emerging technologies. And so having the right guardrails in place to make sure that people's rights are protected so these, this, the technology is being used responsibly, people have agency, uh, you know, to make
make decisions over how their data is used is really kind of a fundamental uh, principle, you know, that must be embedded. Um, but beyond that, also making sure that, you know, the, the, the policies and laws that are put in place are there to stimulate, you know, innovation and create an innovation-friendly culture. Um, and so, you know, just lastly, with Rwanda's um, uh, development of their national AI policy, you know, really moving it beyond theory to make it very instructive. And one of the things that, you know, we looked at is how can we really ground it in some of the key objectives that are already there in, 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 in kind of the government's um, strategy. Now we're at Vision 2050. Uh, we looked at, you know, what are the use cases that are really able to unlock, you know, value, accelerate, uh, you know, some of the goals that are in place and, and taking it a step further to quantify what could be the possible contribution, you know, to the GDP because you have such a, you know, broad list of, of possible applications, but really being focused to say how will this improve, you know, the lives of our population. And so that's really how we, you know, uh, kind of grounded the AI policy. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really, you know, responding to the needs of the population. Thank you very much, Crystal. Is there any story of a successful impact story of <laughs> AI adoption mm. that you would like to share? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think particularly we know that uh, when we speak about um, generative AI, there's there's so many possible you know applications that um, could really bring value to the community. But I think health the health sector is one of the most promising um, it's one of the areas that we've already started building a pilot so Rwanda has um, you know roughly 70,000 uh, community healthcare workers so these are really the frontline workers that are kind of at the lowest level lowest you know jurisdiction um, uh, you know within the within the country um, you know before people go to a clinic uh, before they see a nurse or you know are, are um, seen by a doctor these these are the people who are you know trying to you know, uh, discern whether or not they need more critical care. Um, and so we also know that they're not trained, right? They're not trained as nurses. They're given kind of basic information. And so giving them access to tools um, like generative AI, especially those that are kind of really customized for the medical context, could give them access to tremendous, you know, information and, and, and access to kind of a greater skill set. Um, but most of those community health workers are not conversant in English. And so we've built a, a translation model that it's both voice and text-based, um, so they can interact with it and be able to, you know, um, uh, you know, be able to discern, you know, if someone has a headache, if someone has a cough. Um, if you're in the U.S. context, you know, that might mean that you have the flu. In our context, it could possibly be, you know, tuberculosis, you know, for example. And so it was really important for us, one, not just to uh, look at it from a linguistic perspective, but, but, you know, the the context that we're in, you know, being able to train it with the question and answer data sets that um are really aligned to 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 our environment, and so we we've seen you know in, in, in the, the the training that we've done initially we were looking at we were using um, uh, ChatGPT four, um, and so you know it started out with about eight percent accuracy um, initially, um, and over the over the last twelve months we've now reached seventy one percent accuracy. Um, we're continuing to build on that work to do a, a silent trial uh, with the community health workers validated by the nurses and doctors in those clinics. And so I see that as one of the most promising use cases. But I think that there, there's so many that we've actually documented through um, the national AI policy, not just for the health sector, but all of the key priority sectors for the government. And, and what the government is now doing is also um, curating open data sets for these specific use cases that they can then partner with the innovation community, partner with the startups, because we know that they, they already have some solutions. And so the, the, the bottleneck is actually them being able to have access to, uh, to the data to be able to, to, to train them and validate their, their hypothesis. I really like this specific mm -hmm. illustration and especially the comparison that you make uh, between uh, health context in mm -hmm. the US versus Rwanda. And which challenges uh, Rwanda or other African uh, uh, countries are facing when it comes to AI adoption? Will you mind elaborating a little bit more, Krista? Yeah, sure. So I think data data is certainly one. Um, I think it's it's 
It's both the challenge and also one of the greatest opportunities. You, you mentioned, you know, the, the rich um, linguistic diversity of the content we're, continent. We're talking about um, about 1,400 distinct dialects. Now, we may not have applications that can, you know, um, interact in 1,400 dialects, but um, certainly, you know, we should be able to serve the majority, you know, of our populations. And so, I see that as one area where both the government as well as the private sector should really be investing, um, because it's a challenge for us to be able to take part and, and benefit from the technologies that are there. But it's also just such a missed opportunity to be able to serve um, a really vibrant, you know, young population. I think um, maybe the other, you know, would be around um, affordable compute. So we see a lot of startups who have fantastic ideas, you know, that we've seen, you know, come come about over really the last two years with, with uh, um, kind of the proliferation of, of, of gen generative AI. Um, but they can only go so far in being able to pilot these solutions because it's prohibitively expensive, you know. Um, and so that's an area where I think as African governments are really trying to think how can we pool our capacity to be able to, you know, um, a better service serve the innovation community. Um, and, and so I think that that's an area where it really would require um, you know, public-private um, and philanthropic partnership. Um, and so I think that that's also you know, a significant uh, challenge, but also um, I think even more so an opportunity. So what I'm hoping is that you know, we're not just um, looking at, uh, when we talk about inclusive AI and equitable access, it's not just um, making sure that people are not left behind, but really framing it in a business context. There's a huge opportunity, you know, with this, uh, you know, growing youth population that will be, you know, 40% of youth by 2040 uh, will be African, you know, and so there's a market there, you know, and, 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 and this is a market that can also become, you know, the world's digital workforce. And so we should be, you know, creating an enabling environment so they can solve for these issues, yeah. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Crystal. Uh, now I will turn to uh, Minister. Uh, the UAE has been incredibly uh, amazing at bridging the digital divide. Which lessons will you advise to other uh, emerging uh, nations and least developed countries uh, in bridging the AI gap? Uh, thank you very much. I think. Um, when we talk about AI development, there is a life cycle. And there is a requirement for investment in infrastructure. I think that is necessary if you want to deploy AI effectively. Um, I, there is no one-size-fits-all approach for all, for all governments. Analyzing where you stand and where you can deploy AI effectively and which sectors will have the biggest impact is necessary before jumping on the opportunity that comes to your table from any different player from around the world. Another uh, important fact is, I think one of the biggest challenges that government face is ignorance within the decision-making process, which is, you know, if a government official needs to decide whether or not to deploy AI, if they don't understand what AI is mm -hmm. or isn't, they will take decisions that are based in ignorance, and I think that will ultimately lead to bad uh, you know, uh, outcomes. <clears throat> in most cases, upskilling uh, government officials is necessary, upskilling them to understand what AI can and cannot do. How do you actually silence the fear mongers? Because everyone's talking about AI at one point of time reaching the, the ability to control us and to take over the world. But the reality of the matter is today AI is far away from that and we need to actually look at what it can and cannot do instead of listening to the fear mongers or the optimists. A government official needs to sit in the middle, needs to be very pragmatic, needs to be both an optimist and a pessimist, pessimist for the bad uh, challenges that will arise because of AI and optimist for the good use cases. And then uh, if we talk about capacity building, you know, one of the challenges that I see, and, and you know, there's something we've seen in the UAE, um, what do we mean by capacity building? So you know, I hear, depending on the meetings that I go to, we're going to train a million people in AI. What does training a million people in AI mean? Are you talking about prompt engineers? Are you talking about AI experts? Because if it's AI experts, I think globally there isn't a million people, right? Identifying what they should or, sh or should not do or can or cannot do is important. Having a standardized approach of what does AI literate mean, what does an AI expert mean, uh, is something that we require. Today, if I, I tell you, for example, that I'm going to hire a cert, you know, chartered accountant or char chartered financial advisor, you know exactly what that means. 
If I tell you hire an AI expert, no one understands. Mm. Uh, other than Jan and a few people who have a Turing <laughs> Award. Honestly, it's very difficult to understand uh, as a government official what it means and what I'm paying for and what I'm actually working on building. So I think there is a necessity for us to create this framework to understand. AI literacy means you'd be able to prompt effectively, increase your productivity. For example, um, an AI expert, someone that can do X, Y, and Z. Maybe for certain fronts, you don't need an AI expert. You need a CTO in the, in the government that's able to do that. Um, my final advice is, so one thing we're going to announce in the UAE uh, and, and hopefully deploy soon, is we're going to open access for government departments to have um, CTO uh, as a service um, uh, for the government departments to understand you know, what we need to do, how we can deploy effectively, what investments need to be made uh, from an expert. And, and that CTO is going to have both the understanding of a conventional CTO, but also on where the government is going on AI and what needs to happen there. I think having that kind of um, uh, umbrella uh, approach is, is also probably a good idea for governments to think about. Thank you so much, Excellency, for providing a comprehensive strategy <laughs> to further leverage uh, AI and bridge the digital uh, AI gap. Sebastian, so uh, what is the role that the private sector can play in further bridging that AI uh, divide? I think first, um, choosing to prioritize, right, bridging these different divides, right, and, de and declaring and then implementing that it matters, that it's important, uh, and that, you know, these end goals of having the benefits of this sets of technology, and again, an end-to-end -end type of way where so that inclusivity, right, it's not an afterthought, right? Trust, it's not an afterthought. Right, equality, you know, all these sort of sets of elements, you know, and also, you know, how do you upskill everyone, right? How do you bring a level of that AI and technology literacy and engagement and comfort and confidence, right? Not as an afterthought, but actually as core, right, to the overall sort of sets of, uh, you know, sets of items. Um, I think we also need to be, you know, the private sector ought to be developing and modeling, you know, best practices and shared practices on emerging practices on responsible, right, adoption, on responsible um, deployment, right, and implementation around these uh, sets of ways. Uh, and then again, I think that both the, the mindset, but also deeply in the, the implementation around thinking of how are we creating healthy ecosystems, right, that are balancing innovation with, uh, you know, again, prioritizing the right kinds of impact. So I really like this. And to what extent could you connect the AI policy principle, which were launched, uh, to a uh, broader generalization? How will you export, sell those principles so that other companies can also help, whether in, in the US or around the world, uh, from your leadership on the question? It's, it's a great, it's a great I'll, I'll definitely think about that more. But, but the point is that we want to have frameworks that are interoperable right, across regions, across contexts, mm -hmm. also in a way across industries, even as, you know, kind of we at Salesforce, we see and work across industries, and so there's areas where there's very, you go very, very deep in the industry specific, right, sets of elements. Um, but, you know, having the right sets of, uh, you know, partnerships around it, you know, here, you know, with, with, with WEF, right, we have a, a global AI steering committees, right, global, you know, AI, uh, you know, alliances, you know, and the like. But I think as we empower and upskill Industries, nonprofits, communities, you know, regions, the point is that, you know, whether it's our framework, whether it's sort of other frameworks, we actually, everyone gets, um, uh, gets experience, right, with using them, with implementing them, and then ultimately, right, with updating, you know, sort of and uh, revising them so that, you know, ultimately, this is how we think of it at Salesforce, we think of it with Agent Force, Agentic AI. Um, this is the most exciting, right, kind of computer science project, right, that we've ever had. And yet, it should not just be AI for AI's sake, right? It's balancing development with transparency, with sustainability, with uh, inclusivity. It's also how we're going to get the best kind of innovation at scale. Love the point. <laughs> so, uh, Professor, so to what extent can we uh, partner with various stakeholders, so you, Meta, for example, uh, among other, to really achieve that inclusive AI? So when I think 
I think it's important to project ourselves in the future and imagine what the future is going to be and then work towards making that future the, the best uh, possible. So the, the way the technology, I'm a technology, I'm a scientist, right? So I, I try to envision where technology is going and what is going to, to be made possible. We're going to have systems within some number of years, it's very difficult to tell exactly when, uh, but systems that uh, match human intelligence in all respects or, or surpass it in many respects. So this is going to be a situation where every one of us is going to be empowered by uh, a team, a staff of AI assistants working for us, essentially. Right? And this is going to be true for anyone who can access the internet, essentially. Um, how are those systems going to be accessed? They're not necessarily going to be accessed to smartphones. The, the future of hardware is going to be things like uh, smart glasses, mm -hmm. um, which can see what you see, can hear what you hear, can remember what you don't remember and help you remember it, um, can answer any question you have. So it's like having a, a human staff working for you at all times. Um, and those systems will have displays. So the, this kind of devices are coming up you know, within the next year or two. Um, and what that enables is interaction between people in their own language, for example. So we already have prototype systems that can translate hundreds of languages in any direction. We are starting to have systems that can translate non-written languages um, as well. So directly from speech to speech, mm -hmm. we can do text to text, text to speech, speech to text, and speech to speech, including for languages that are not written, of which there are many, of course, in the, um, in the world, including the developed world. Uh, it's not a, just an issue mm -hmm. of uh, Global South. And so uh, AI will basically facilitate access to that knowledge and information because people could interact with AI systems through voice. You don't need to, to know anything. You need to learn how to use mm -hmm. you know, GUIs or whatever. You can, you can just talk to those systems. And the, the reason why we want to um, basically make them match human intelligence is because that's what humans are used to do. We're, we're used to interacting with humans. And so if you have a system that you can interact with, as if it were a human, uh, you don't need to learn anything new. Um, so that, that's kind of the future. But then again, uh, that future needs to be diverse. So for the same reason that we need access to a wide diversity of sources of information, you know, through the press or social media or whatever, we also need a high diversity of AI assistants to cater to all of our diverse uh, interests and cultural norms and mm -hmm. value systems and languages. Thank you very much, Prof. Crystal, uh, what about the uh, leadership, uh, the continental leadership of Rwanda in framing the broader AI uh, uh, initiative uh, in the continent, mm -hmm. but also the African Union AI strategy? Do you have hope that this will help bridging the gap within the continent, within the countries, and between the continent and the rest of the world? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been uh, it's an interesting time. We've seen, you know, different regions of the world, uh, you know, coming together to have a common uh, understanding and kind of shared objectives, you know, around um, AI, um, both from a kind of societal aspect, but um, there's also the element of, of, of kind of competition. <laughs> and Africa is often left out of many of those conversations or, or an afterthought. And so what I've seen emerging, you know, over the last year or so is a lot of conversations around how can Africa uh, come together, one, to have a shared um, shared vision for how AI can accelerate some of the, the, the commitments and, and the vision for the continent. And obviously the leadership of the AU, I think, um, you know, has been outstanding in putting in place a continental strategy. There's also Smart Africa, you know, made up of 41 member states um, that put in place an AI blueprint a couple years ago. Um, and so building on that, um, one, you know, Rwanda is, is the only country at the moment that actually hosts one of the centers uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. We're one of 20, uh, 
um, you know, in the network, but the only one on the continent. And so we said, one, you know, we get access to these spaces and conversations and networks, and how can we leverage that, you know, to make sure that we're kind of bringing everyone along, you know, as we um, are, are, are kind of collectively embarking on on this AI journey. And so one of the the steps that the the, the that Rwanda has taken um, is to host the inaugural Global AI Summit on Africa. Um, it will be hosted um, April of, of 2025. And, and the theme around it, you know, much you know, speaking to, to, to what I mentioned earlier, you know, we have this rapidly growing, you know, youth population, you know, home to the fastest growing workforce in the world. Um, how do we harness that opportunity? You know, you know AI and, and this huge, you know, demographic dividend that Africa has, and how can we really reimagine what those economic opportunities could be for the workforce? So we're not just, you know, catching up, but we're actually building a workforce that is prepared to fully engage, you know, in, in the future and what are the steps that we can take now, you know, just referencing how, uh, you know, the government, you know, invested, you know, more than 20 years ago, it's brought us to this moment where we have, you know, where people are connected enough, you know, not mm -hmm. not completely, but they're connected enough to, to at least be able to, um, you know, take part in, in some of the opportunities that are there. So we, we of course, we want to share our learnings, but we also want to, to make sure that we are, uh, I think there's, there's circulation of knowledge across, you know, the continent. And so we're hoping, you know, that we can invite the world, you know, to, to engage with Africa on this topic um, through this inaugural summit and, and really be able to build on some of the, um, you know, the good work that has been happening globally. What a wonderful way <laughs> to bring this session yeah. to conclusion, uh, yeah. Crystal. So I'm incredibly grateful for the words of wisdom that you have shared. So some key takeaway include uh, to focus on global and equitable access uh, to AI technologies and infrastructure, inclusivity for AI models and applications, also uh, to address uh, the digital divide and the AI uh, divide so that uh, in a very intentional way so that they constitute an opportunity uh, versus a risk. Uh, also using AI as a catalyst for the broader transformation of uh, society, for the broader economic benefits and not just because it's a technology. And finally, leveraging the global and regional initiative, promoting a better access, but also uh, usage and effective productive usage of uh, AI to build a better world. On this note, I would like to thank our audience for joining us this morning for this incredible session. Thank you and see you soon. <laughs>